Do you feel ready, Brooke? I'm ready. In life, do you feel ready? Fuck no. Yeah. All right, good. All right, we're good. all winging it. Come on, right? Like, none of us know what we're doing. That is a fact. That's a fact. That is a fact, Dr. Brooke Weinstein. Welcome back to Men This Way. How are you feeling today? I am good. I'm so glad to be back. I, I think I speak for all three of us when we were like, no, wait, like, let's not let the podcast end. Like, let's just keep talking. And I feel like we could have sat there the rest of the day and just like kept talking and talking and talking. So um, I'm really glad to be back. And I feel like immediately we were like, okay, we need to do that again. So it's yeah. nice to be back. Yeah. Oh, like, God. We're, we're really glad to have you back. Just to remind our audience, this is part two of a conversation. I think our last episode was, was it August that that came out of 2024, depending on when you're so anyway, just to remind our, our listeners, if, you're, if you've uh, heard our episode with Brooke before, or you're just turning in, Dr. Brooke Weinstein is a world-renowned thought leader on parenting. She specializes in neuroscience-based sensory and emotional regulation, combines a background in occupational therapy and neuroscience, a deep knowledge of the brain trauma and sensory regulation principles to offer step-by-step -step practical parenting advice to help transform the entire household. My God, how I wish my parents knew this work, Brooke, no doubt. when I was growing up. My, my goodness. Uh, Brooke's been featured on uh, Today, Forbes, and my favorite, Scary Mommy. So again, welcome back, uh, Brooke. We're really glad to, to be continuing this conversation with you today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, during our last conversation, we we talked a lot really about you, you have this amazing podcast, Thrive Like a Parent. And uh in our first episode together, we thought we might go down the down the parenting rabbit hole, but we spent a lot of time where we where we should have, which is really around like how do we as parents, how do we deal with our own emotional regulation? How do we navigate uh, the challenges of ourselves and our in our lives? And, you know, today, what we're really wanting to do is go down that rabbit hole around children, right? And, and to dive deeper into the developmental stages of children, the unique experiences and needs that, that those children have at various stages and so how parents can help really navigate their children. And I, I think maybe as a, as a bridge from the last conversation to this conversation, let's talk about co-regulation in regards to kind of the parent-child relationship, what, what is it and why should parents know what it is and, and, and why does it matter? So I could give you a long or short-winded answer. Um, the short answer is if anyone has worked with horses before, if anyone has heard of like, you know, their field of being able to feel what's around them, it is very, very similar with humans. And we just aren't, taught or we don't even recognize or understand that that exists. And when your energy is in, you know, the surroundings of others, we're going to feel or feed off of that energy. And that is the basic explanation of co-regulation, right? And I'm sure everyone listening to this and, and both of you can be like, oh yeah, like I know, you know, when so-and-so walks in the door and I'm like, oh boy, they had a bad day at work. Like, oh, they're not doing so great. We're like, oh, maybe we should like, you know, go on this side of the house and keep them over there. Or um, maybe we should check in with them and be like, hey, how you doing? And they'll be like, nothing, like nothing's wrong, you know? And we're like, okay. Like, but that absolutely affects us. It 1000% affects us. And my long-winded answer is part of an example of myself of when I was, you know, moving through my own grief and struggling and um, even doing this work on myself of sensory and emotional regulation, which I had gone to school, I'd done the thing, but I hadn't adapted it for myself. I could watch this pattern of, okay, I when I was literally first, first doing it, I was like, okay, I didn't even recognize I was dysregulated that lasted for about okay three weeks like I would track in the beginning like a three-week cycle I would all of a sudden come out of this dysregulation the house would be like in disarray and a mess and all the things because I was in that heightened state and then it kind of like trickled almost like 
as as if you were on a roller coaster, it was like going down, right? Like I was going down and then I could see that my kids were up and I was like, oh, they're not doing so great. So then I was regulated. Then I had to help get them regulated of like, hey, like we're let, like, let's get back in business. Like, let's all get down here. And so I would see this like wave where my kids would almost trail my regulation and dysregulation. And I was able to see how much that concept of that co-regulation really, truly matters. Brian had and I had this conversation and we, we often do before a guest will come on around like, how will we know that the podcast was successful? What do we, what do we really want to make sure that we cover? And, and one of the things that was top of mind for me as a parent who, who wished that he had found you a decade ago, um, was this idea that that there are these various developmental stages and obviously the first step in the process, this is what we talked about in, in podcast one was how do we regulate ourselves? How do we have our own school uh, skills, tools, et cetera, to be able to drop into the moment and meet our kids' needs? Well, the second is that our kids, it, it, what we want for every listener is to be able to meet the needs of a parent that is parenting at different stages. So if you have an infant, what do you need to do if you have a three-year-old? And so we're going to walk through some of these developmental stages so that if you're a parent, there's going to be a nugget for you to be able to take away. And, and I, I'm thinking first and foremost about, right, that, that, that infancy. It's, it's a, this period where all of these sensory, um, uh, you know, modalities are coming online. They're rapidly developing. Motor and language development is coming online. How can parents support their children's sensory and emotional development during this stage of infancy, zero, zero to two, let's yeah, say? Yeah, that's. A, I love that you guys are doing this. And this is really crucial information. And I think it's important because, you know, individuals listening, we don't know what stage their, you know, family is at. Right. Um, and I actually want to take it a step back because, and then go into infancy. But yeah. what again, parents don't know or don't realize is that if you have a preemie, which I had two, the very last thing in utero to develop, like literally the last few weeks of in utero, like in the belly, is your nervous system. It is starting to come online. It is starting to just wake up and be like, oh, wow, like this is okay. Like we're feeling things here. If that is disrupted and you have a preemie, if you have a traumatic birth, imagine like your brain is collecting data. Your brain is building memories. And like I had a very traumatic birth with Charlie, my oldest. And Charlie has been the one who has struggled with that sensory and emotional regulation. There's also in the NICU, there's beeping lights and, and dinging and missing and natting. Also, if your child is colicky, that word colicky is like, oh, I just got like like sucks for me. I just got, you know, the pick of the litter. Like my kid unfortunately doesn't sleep. It's not necessarily just like colicky that they're uncomfortable and this and that. It's really their lack of ability to be able to regulate. So if your children had any like tongue ties and feeding issues and premature births or, or a traumatic, you know, birth where like, like Charlie was pulled out with forceps, like that's what I'm talking about. Or like you pushed for a really long time, like all of that really does affect the brain because that's the brain's, it's already starting to build those memories and patterns. And so if you have a child who, let's say is more needy, infant, we should call it, an infant who is more needy, take a look back at like, did anything happen during pregnancy? Did anything happen during birth? Did anything happen after birth? Did your child struggle with, you know, colicky or acid reflux at night or, or could not get themselves down or wouldn't sleep through the night. Like all of those things are a precursor to be like, oh boy, like, like here, like I should expect big things coming up within my child's life. Like I should expect that we're going to need to support my child on more of a sensory level and, and make sure that I understand what's going on with them. Now, when you're in that infancy stage, I think the biggest thing you can do is deep pressure, massages, um, see if they like the water, let them play, let them get dirty, let them get messy. I used to, 
you know, put shaving cream in front of both of my kids when they are babies. And I was like, let's see if they're avoidant or let's see if they're like seekers. And Charlie was like, let's go. And like, just like dove in. And Eli was like, he touched it and he looked at it and he cried. And I was like, "Mm -hmm." and I knew they would both have those reactions because Charlie is my seeker. Eli is like, I don't want to get dirty. I'm kind of an avoider, like pass. Like, we'll, we'll just, you know, like, please, but no, thank you, you know? And I was like, it's whipped cream. Come on, like, suck it down, right? But you can understand those things from such a young age within your children, but you have to have the lens to be able to see those things and, and have those markers and understand what that means in order to be able to support those needs. I think the biggest piece is the awareness, if you will. I would, I would imagine a lot of parents experience annoyance first if, they're, if their kid isn't doing the thing that they think the kid should do. A thousand percent. I mean, what's the consequence of, of annoyance? What's the consequence of even like one of the things that comes up for me too is knowing this was in my early childhood home is, is you know, a lot of fighting. I think a, a lot of people might think uh, like my parents fought a lot and I wasn't conscious of this. Uh, actually it was something my mom had to tell me in retrospect. Um, I was really, I mean, I, I remember it when I'm around three or four, but I know that was happening at birth and in the, in the times after. And I'm just curious, what are some of these consequences of, on, on a child's development that we might not otherwise even think as a thing because it's just a baby. They can't hear anything. They can't see anything. They're not, they don't know what's going on here. Yeah, it really, it really does all matter. I mean, um, they're, they're clocking and tracking and their brains are doing the work of collecting data to learn the universe and to learn the world that they're surrounded in and their environment and how they function within their environment. And um, even kids, you know, it's like, you know, one years old, it's like, Food is just for fun, but parents get so wrapped up and like, oh my God, they're gagging or like, oh my gosh, they, they don't like vegetables or, oh my gosh, they don't like this and they don't like that. You know, your kiddo, again, you have to look at like, was the birth successful or quote typical? Um, were they a preemie? I had to literally put my like lens, like my hat on and lens of like, I'm an OT in this moment and I needed to work, especially with Charlie on like lateralizing his tongue and, and, and getting food in his body and learning all that. But he was avoidant of, of that sensory piece within his mouth. And we just think, oh, it's fine. Like give him a chicken bone and like baby led weaning and like they'll, they'll figure it out. They're going to, some of them may gag. Like some of them may not do well in really crowded environments and may cry if you bring them to loud music, you know, mommy and me or daddy and me classes, you know, like you have to pick up on those cues and start recognizing what type of brain they have, what what they feel successful or safe in, or where they feel safe and where they don't. And then we can support that after, again, that awareness comes. But it sometimes is annoying. Hey, before we go past this, because, uh, and, and I want to just call out that I think we should probably do, how many stages are we talking about here, Tate? Five or six. I think we're gonna have to do five or six podcasts, one for each day. <laughs> Let's do it because there's so much to explore I know. here. Like m- my wife and I, we're you know we don't have uh, children. We've I've been I've shared that you know we've struggled to conceive and and probably can't. And so we're exploring adoption. And one of the big questions, one of the things that we've been told to be as aware of as we can, is the mother during pregnancy what was her life like what kind of stress was she carrying what was and that you know on some level as a potential adopting parent that has me a little terrified cuz i yeah will i get to how important is that you know there is so much literature on that of like if a if a if a female who's pregnant is under stress it really affects the embryo and the baby. And like, I, I hear that. I fully get that. And I absolutely like co-regulation. Like I, I, I believe in that. However, nature versus nurture. And, you know, I, ex- I think especially with my own experience of just my journey of life and what my own children have gone through, both of my children were preemies. Like they were out of the womb before they should have been 
They did not get a fully regulated nervous system before they came out. Like they had a few notches against them, you know, and they had to kind of rise to the occasion of they should have been in my belly for both of them were 33 weekers. So for about seven more weeks. And then they've had this absolutely crazy trauma that's happened to them in their lives. And it's it's the most unthinkable thing for a child to go through is to lose a parent. And they've lost their parent, one of their parents at a very, very young age. But at the same time, I promise I won't. Well, I'll try not to get choked up. But at the same time, I was literally thinking the other day about how I hear things from other people and I'm not boasting about my children, but I also observe and watch other children as well. And I could not be more proud of my boys and I could not be more proud of how respectful and polite they are. It definitely took work. Don't don't like it definitely took work. But I'm at their ages, seven and ten. I feel that they are pretty well-rounded individuals who are well-adjusted, especially, like I said, even with having a preemie nervous system, even with Charlie definitely struggling along the way with some sensory stuff of like his body and brain just required a little bit more in terms of sensory and emotional regulation. And now that he's 10, I, like I, I can't, I really think it's how we choose to support our children. And I, I think as we move in, if you want to keep going through each stage, I think one thing that's really important is that we not only need to be aware of our children and what's going on and how to support them on a neurological level, sensory and emotionally. However, boundaries are still more than okay, even when we're doing this sensory and emotional regulation style of parenting. And I think that that's really getting lost in translation with so much in the world today of gentle and conscious parenting and, and you know, trying to push our kids to be more emotional and it's okay to cry, like all these things. I think we are somehow becoming so afraid of the opposite lens. And I, I think it's partly because we necessarily didn't love it when we were, you know, held to strict rules or boundaries growing up. And we're like, that wasn't fun. Why would my kid want that? But I've seen both and I've worked with a lot of parents who have come to me and they're like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I'm talking to them. I'm letting them share their feelings. And I'm like, they're, they're running the show, you know, they're running the show. And so boundaries have an absolute place and are necessary within sensory and emotional regulation style of parenting. I have a, a friend and then Tate, I'm gonna let you take us on from here. But a, a friend years ago, I remember her, she had, uh, I went to visit her and she had like a, maybe a two-year-old or a three-year-old and she was practicing, she was committed to never telling the child no. And, you know, directing it, doing this. And, and I, I don't know, I don't know. It was, it was like at the time, like, I guess, you know, okay, sounds like an interesting experiment. Sure. <laughs> maybe sure. the kid's a monster now. I have no sure. idea. I would need a muzzle, but sure. I mean, <laughs> to each their own. It's very admirable. Like, don't get me wrong. That's very admirable. I don't know. I definitely don't think I could do and, that. And I don't mean, she didn't mean it like um, whatever he wants is a yes. It's I'm going to try, I'm going to work with what's happening here in a way that where he doesn't feel right blocked. He doesn't feel to frame it a different way. Mm -hmm. Scolded, you know, this and that. And I, but I can, I can see how that really is a react can be, could be a reaction to, you know, an extreme reaction to, uh, I can't, but I'll just say, I can't imagine being a parent and never telling my child not only no, but hell fucking no. Yeah. At some point, yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a perfect segue because this next stage is really, you know, early childhood development, three to five. And one of the things I've heard you talk about it is how important it is for us to be able to own our sadness. And my, my question is really around how can a parent really model this for children, but, but tying in this conversation around boundaries. How also can a parent, what, what are the important boundaries to be setting for kids about how their sadness or upset is being expressed? So almost two yeah. at continue. And this particular topic, we could literally have a whole podcast on. But I believe that from the ages of around three to five is when we're doing the most work with our kids in terms of it's the tantrum phase, it's the meltdown phase. And if you don't know there is an absolute difference between a tantrum and a meltdown. And 
I don't know if we went over that last time, but we as adults have it too. A tantrum is you absolutely know what you want. I want another cookie. Why can't I have another cookie? Or like, I wanted flowers. Why didn't you get me flowers? You know, like that's a tantrum. We know exactly what we want. A meltdown is I wanted you to cut the sandwich this way, but I wanted you to cut the sandwich that way. But I want, but like, dude, I cut the sandwich the way you wanted me to cut it. Like there's no other crop, like there's, there's no other way to cut it. Like they're at this point, it's in tiny little squares. It's like, what do you want me to do? Right. They have no idea what they want. They have no idea what they need. And they're just completely melting down. And that's when their brain is completely offline. And that's when they're literally so dysregulated that their brain is trying to regulate for them. And usually it ends in a meltdown and hysterics and crying. And then all of a sudden it's over. And they're like, I love you. And you're like, can I, can I give you a hug? And they're like the, the most cuddliest, loviest. And you're like, what, 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 like you're possessed. Like, what is that? And it's because their nervous system truly regulated through all those tears and crying and melting down and screaming and the hoopla, right? All of that. But I think that at three to five, it's really that age to allow children to explore. Again, we can still hold boundaries, but really also modeling to them, like you were asking, like, how can a parent do this? You know, I've heard before people DM me and they're like, I'm crying in the closet. I don't want my daughter to see my grandfather just died and I don't want her to see me crying. She's going to be so upset. And it is okay to express emotions. Like it is more than okay to demonstrate like, hey, I'm on red. Like I feel frustrated. I need you to step outside this room and it has nothing to do with you. I love you. Like just give me a moment and I'll like, I'll be right out. Right. Versus like, get out. Like, what are you doing? You know, we can snap at our kids and just like get pissed off or we can share with them our emotion of like, hey, this is how I'm feeling. And then they know it has nothing to do with them and they can separate mommy just screamed at me or daddy just screamed at me versus, oh, they're going through some emotions and like, I'm, I'm going to like exit and, and like not, you know, like had that codependency of like, this was my fault, right? And I think between that three to five age, there's also, you you need to work on how do you feel? 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 Like, that's the only question you should be asking them. Like, Johnny pushed me on the playground. Instead of saying, oh, well, we didn't like Johnny anyway. Like, go play with Sarah tomorrow. Like, Johnny sucks, right? Like, we want to be like, well, how did that make you feel? Because they really just want to feel seen and heard at that age. And we are building those blocks at that age of three to five to really help them know that it's okay to express their their emotions, express their feelings, and um, really be able to model that as well. Also, I will say between the ages of three to five, if your kids are saying things like, I hate you, or, you know, like every now and then, I hate you. Three to five-ish, they don't necessarily understand like the implications of what that means or they don't really understand if they're um, really calculating or it looks manipulative, but I would prefer the word calculating or, you know, if they'll say things to hurt you or they'll um, not want to give you attention, things like that. They're playing around with all of those kinds of things within in that particular chunk. But I would say really past five, my cut, my cutoff is six of like, nope, like, mm -mm. like, like I'm keeping the lights on. I'm cooking you your meals. Like, I don't want to be told that you hate me. Like, I don't really want like, no, like, so like you can't because I say so, you know, Um, but that three to five, we allow them to explore and really move through their emotions. There's a lot of tantrums, a lot of meltdowns, um, but really. And, and some more than others, too, depending on their nervous system. Um, if they're really, really struggling with meltdowns and tantrums, that tells me, again, that they're really struggling to regulate, really, really struggling to regulate. And they will need a little bit more assistance in that realm. Again, I've had two completely different kiddos. One of them was sharing how they were feeling at the age of two. The other one, I had to, like, pull the words out of him. And I was like, how do you feel? And like. He did something at school and I was like, but how did you feel? And he was like, I was jealous. And I was like, yes. So I was like, you're not punished. Like, I didn't care. Like, he didn't need a consequence because he was able to share like why he did what he did. And then we could have a conversation of like, hey, that's probably not cool to do that, you know? Um, 
But really pulling out those how do you feel statements within that three to five age is really, really crucial. I think that's such critical, um, practical advice, right? Because it, it, um, I, re I remember those stages for both of my kids and I was, I was not clued into, it wasn't really about uh, managing their behavior. Obviously, you know, there have to be boundaries about in ways to protect them and the people around them in some ways. But, but if it's really the, the, the game is really about the identification of the emotions and allowed the, the question of that and the exploration of that to let them know that, that all their feelings are welcome rather than, Hey, I'm just trying to manage your behavior. And as long as your behavior is okay, I don't care how you feel, <laughs> right? Which is the wrong message. It's almost like in some ways, I don't care what your behavior is. I care how you feel because you're, you're able to tap into that. Now you start to gain control and agency over the actions you're going to take. Yeah. Like a good example of that is if a kid comes up to you and you're talking to a hostess of a birthday party, like a kid birthday party, and your kiddo comes up to you and they're like, I, I want to leave. And you're like, how rude. Like, you can't say that in front of the host. Like, that's so rude. They're telling you they want to leave because they're done. It could be because they're overloaded with sensory stimuli. It could be because something happened. It could be because they're not having fun. It could be because they're tired. It could, it could be many, many reasons, right? And it's not necessarily rude that they're stating their needs. Like it's, it's not rude, but we look at it as, oh boy, like, ooh, like that's, that's not polite, you know? Another one too with that age three to five is if they're struggling Let's say you're like, we're going to go here and then we're going to go there and then we're going to go here. And then you have to switch up the schedule and they just completely lose it or they really melt down to go anywhere new or any birthday parties, things like that. That is a good sign that they're really struggling with their sensory and emotional regulation in terms of transition and feeling safe in a new environment. I had one client who was like, I have twins who would just sit in the car and hysterically cry. And I'm like at the park sweating, like your friends are out there. We're at a play date and they wouldn't get out the car, you know? And that's not just because they feel like being, you know, buttheads. It's, it's because they're, they're struggling and they, they can't verbalize it at three to five, really. I, I imagine that this is, you know, as I'm listening to this, I'm just, you know, we, we work with, you know, tape nine, the work we do, one of the things that we always come, come up against is shame in, you know, in adults, there's so much shame at play and, and the, the, the spirals that that can send people down. And, and I'm, as I'm listening to this, I'm imagining that, that, that period of three to five, look how many adults even today still, you know, have the skills, have the presence of mind and not take it personal, right? When, when a, when a four-year-old says, I hate you, or does something so-called rude. And, and I would imagine that this is a, a period of time where I remember seeing, um, uh, probably the kid was four. This was decades ago. I saw this and, and at a, at a friend's house also. And I think the kid was wanting mom. We were having all sitting on a couch, sitting around and, and, uh, uh, the kid ended up, he was kind of being ignored by the adults as, you know, as a four-year-old will tend to be in that kind of scene. And, and he, I remember he like knocked a glass of milk out of his mom's hand and dad reacted to that by you know, first the, you know, the, the stern, no, how, you know, don't you dare kind of thing. And then he, and then dad crosses his arms and turns his body away from the child. You can see the child's like reaching out for care, for attention, for something. And I remember seeing dad just cross his arms and just turn like st stone wall. Nope. You don't get my love. I remember that, I, that, that moment struck me. I, I remember it so viscerally. I don't remember anything else about that evening, but that really struck me. Because I, again, I, I'm no, I was, was no expert then, am no expert now, but something in that just felt like that's, that's not going to help that child. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Right. And the hard part too, is that we as parents are so, so effing tired. We're so exhausted. We're so burnt out, you know? We, we talked about the world is moving so fast and there's more pressure on us than ever before. The cost of living is like beyond doable at this point for us. Like we used to all live closer to our families and have more family support. Like there's so many things that have led us to be on an island by ourselves alone, like trying to hack it, you know, with our kids. And 
that parent may not have had anything left in them. And that is why it's so crucially important. You know, when I switched from working with pediatrics to working with parents is they need to recognize and they like have to unapologetically take care of themselves and learn how to regulate for themselves. Because if they don't, you are going to get that. You are going to be pissed off and be like, what? Like, why would you do that? Why did you spill that milk on the floor? Why, you know, like, you're going to be pissed. You're going to snap at your kids and you're not going to want to give them love and attention and snuggles because they're driving you up the wall and they're just another thorn in your side, right? Really. And all you want to do is go in a quiet room and a dark room and you don't want to be touched at the ends of the night. And you're like, intimacy is like a far, foregone conclusion. It's like, fuck that. You know, it's like, we'll get there someday, you know? It's, it's, you're literally just surviving. Like it's, it's, it, you, it's in the trenches. Like we, that, that age is all hands on deck. You're an octopus. You don't really have, you know, your arms free. Like it's, um, it's a lot. It's a lot of work at that age. And just so you know, as we're going through this, um, my mind is calculating, okay, so how old should we adopt a child to skip all this stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like, I mean, I'm thinking uh, right now I'm settling on about 15. That's great. That's well, I mean, then 15, like they're going to lie and cheat and steal and steal your car and go to parties okay. and all the things. 17, but that's, 18, you know, a whole nother right topic. But provided all the other needs have been met in the previous right. stages, right before and, you know, you want to be able to, you know, uh, evaluate that. Not just how, not just now how much stress the mother has been in yeah. uh, pre-birth. Now, now you have all the other things to figure out whether or not their feelings have been asked. Have they played with, uh, you know, shaving cream? There's all kinds of things, Brian. And it gets when you think, because, you know, the, the next stage of development that we want to really talk about is this middle childhood, six to 12 years old. And one of the things, this is true for really both of my kids that obviously this is a, a crucial period for the academic and, and cognitive development of kids. It's also the time when, when many parents begin to get messages from teachers related to potential conditions like ADHD. And so how can parents really delineate be between the challenges that are being caused by sensory and emotional regulation as distinct from um, things like ADHD? Yeah, there's so much in this particular age bracket, which all of them are super important. But, you know, you need to start the process of building boundaries from three to five. You need to show them kind of who's boss in order to get them on board. Six to 12 is where those boundaries matter the most. Consistency of boundaries, as well as teaching them structure, teaching them, you know, you got to brush your teeth before you come downstairs. You can't have breakfast until your shoes are tied or this is that like, and then we're going to do our laundry or we're going to make our bed or we're going to turn our lights out or like all of those things start to come into play of like, you're a functioning human that you can shower and, and you know, flush the toilet and wipe yourself like. There's so much stuff that goes on within that time frame, as well as, like I said earlier, like all the nasty comments of I hate you or whatever it is like those. I believe that at six, they're fully aware and you get to decide like what this absolutely looks like. And um, building in that structure and boundaries is crucial. Now, the question of this is when teachers start to point things out of if your child is, you know, having sensory and emotional regulation issues versus ADHD or any type of diagnosis and things like that. I actually just did a podcast on this um, and it dropped last week. And I've I was actually a little bit more blunt than I've ever been about it because um, I don't know, I, I think I've I've tailored myself in terms of not wanting to piss anyone off, but I. I, you know, ADHD is basically just an overactive nervous system. Like it is basically your nervous system functioning at a higher speed or a faster speed or you're on the gas pedal or you're a little bit more heightened, like in fight or flight. Like that is really what ADHD is, you know, and if you pull up all the the diagnosis symptoms, if you don't have one of those, you're like you're, you know, you're you're perfect, clearly. Right. Like. We all have these symptoms. And when you're dysregulated or when you're burnt out, you're going to have more of these symptoms. And so my issue with these diagnosing is that we're trying to be such an inclusive world and, you know, all the pronouns and, you know, accepting of, of everyone and, and their, you know, authenticity and, and how they choose to live. Like we're trying so hard to just be this 
very accepting, inclusive world, yet somehow we have this old ass book that keeps having more and more additions come out. And every single diagnosis at the end of the diagnosis is the word disorder. Like to me, you know, we don't even use the word handicapped anymore. We use the word, you know, accessible parking. Like, why are we calling people disordered or why, like, why are we saying that you're damaged goods? And for many, it helps them to have the diagnosis because then they can identify and they're like, now I know why I'm not crazy. Totally understand that. But th that word disorder to me is like, it's just a notch on your Rolodex of like, you're a little broken, you know, like you're a little damaged. You're not, you're not typical. You're neuro spicy, like whatever it is. And, you know, if you look at the statistics of how many people are diagnosed with ADHD, if you look at the statistics of, you know, the, even the medications shortages going through, you know, the pandemic and, and just now everyone getting diagnosed, or if you, you know, look at how many individuals are now diagnosed with autism, these rates are going up. They're not going down, like they're going up. But at the same time, what also is going up is the rate at which we're functioning and the rate at which we're watching screens and TVs and the rate at which we're, you know, eating food with all that shit in it. And there's just so much stuff. And I really believe that all the things we're ingesting, it's almost like the evolution of mankind, if you will, based on the numbers of how we're showing more dysregulation within our nervous system. And so we need to kind of adopt this new principle of like, we're all normal, we're all healthy, we just, our brains all function differently. And we all have different thresholds of what we can and cannot accept or have the capacity for, if you will, in terms of the stimuli coming at our brain. Very long-winded answer. How do, you, how do you help parents determine when you should, like, what are the strategies to use that are around non-medication and when do you leverage support for kids with medication, we've dealt with this with both of our kids. Like I've been so against using medication for five years, for six years. I've also been in, in the camp where it's like, I don't, I, I've for my whole life, I've hated labels because I don't want to be put into a box. And yet, you know, there are these various ways in which it, it some things you, sometimes you need to leverage support and sometimes you don't. So how do you help parents delineate when they should and shouldn't medicate their kids? for some of these overly, you know, um, you know, some of these sensory issues that are presenting themselves in really overt ways? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I always preface the medication conversation with it is a personal preference. It is the parent gets to decide and there should be no judgment on, personally on my end of like you get to decide. And the way I, I believe that you decide is how are things going within your life? How are things going within your world? How is your household, right? Like I I've worked with clients who we, we, you know, he, this child definitely needed tons of, of support in terms of like structure and, and boundaries and, and sensory and emotional regulation. Like he needed all of it, but at the same time, he was having a meltdown going in his room, like slamming down a picture frame with glass and like sprinkling it or like putting it by the door. So when the mom walked in, she'd step on the glass and we needed to restructure a lot of things in terms of like sensory and emotional regulation, tons of boundaries. He, she needed to get back in the driver's seat. But then also she made her own choice on how exhausted she was, if she felt like medication was the right thing, if she wanted that medication, she trusted her psychiatrist um, for that. And the one thing I will say with medication is all medications are different. They're all going to affect each child very, very differently. So if you talk to a friend and they're like, oh, this, this methyl, whatever date, you know, this, this was a dream, like this, my child's a different person and like, oh my gosh. Well, if you if you slap that on your child and you're like, but they're now irritable and they're now this and they're not that like, you know, there are tons of interactions with medications. I, I've seen someone who had a child on uh, methylphenidate and an antidepressant who became suicidal and who became even more irritable. And they said, we kept going back to the doctor and we kept saying, this is getting worse. Like, 
they said they'd have a honeymoon period. And the thing to know about medication, I think one of the biggest things is if there is a honeymoon period, but then your child goes back to X, Y, Z, or if it, it's not working after, you know, a, a few weeks or whatever, that means that it's not the right medication. Not that it's the right amount. That means that it's not the right medication. So if you keep piling on more, they may get more agitated, more irritated, more aggressive, more everything, right? So really find a provider who will work with you and someone that you trust. But Medication is not always a bad thing. It's it's another tool in our toolkit that can actually support the child into feeling even better about themselves and to feeling good. So it's it's not always a bad thing. Well, and I think one of the one of the you know places that my wife and I were trying to to delineate and 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 figure out how to deal with it. It was certain for us, it was a lot less about the academic side and it was a lot more about the social interaction. Totally. And so, you know, if as my kids were trying to navigate different social interactions and as they're bumping up against those, so what are the kind of sensory and emotional regulations uh, practices that, that kids at that age, six to 12, can be practicing so that it makes their social interactions uh, smoother. How will parents, what can parents be doing with their kids at that stage to help those social interactions? Okay. So, you know, in, in the three to five stage, we really talked about how do you feel? And I believe that once they get that, once you're, when, if you can ask a child, how do they feel? And they're like, I feel angry or I feel sad. I want you to move on to the next, which is where do you feel it in your body? And you can show them pictures and you can, are your shoulders tense or your jaw clench? Are you this? Are you that? You know, if I see a kiddo chewing on their shirt, which is a big one, chewing on their nails, chewing on their shirt, you know, biting things like, hey, how are you feeling? I'm not going to like get that out of your mouth. What are you doing messing up your shirt? I could give two shits. It's not going to fit in six months anyway. Right. So like, hey, how are you feeling? Right. And then we need to ask, where do you feel it in your body? And then after they get to that, we want to figure out, well, what, what do you need? Because what we're trying to do is two things. Number one is what parents don't realize is that we need to very slowly decrease our codependency as our children get older. Very slowly cut the cord. Very slowly say, you got this on your own. Very slowly give them the tools to be like, congratulations, you're 18, go fly, you know? And if we're still, you know, that cord is still attached, they're going to struggle and they're but they're going to be eaten to the wolves, you know? So we're very, very slowly cutting that cord of that, that co-dependency, which is totally natural because when our babies are first born, like they wouldn't survive if they didn't have us. So it's a very, very natural thing to have a codependent relationship. And I think codependent relationships are really at this point, like kind of looked down upon of like, we shouldn't have a codependent relationship and we should be interdependent and it's very natural. Like it's, I don't understand how it could not be natural, right? The other thing we're doing is we're giving them the ability to be able to say, I feel scared. I, you know, wherever they feel in their body, I need you to open the door or I need you to back up or I need you to like, or, I need to get out or I need to whatever it is, right? I want to empower my children to be able to answer these questions so that when they're on the playground and someone pushes them, they can say, hey, like, I feel I feel upset and like, I didn't like that. And like, I need you to back up or like, I need you to not push me anymore. You know, I want my children to be able to know it is OK to express these exact things of how they feel and, and what's going on in their body and what they need. And then. The last piece that, you know, in six to 12 is really, how do you go get it? Like, how does the child say, I really need some peace and quiet? Okay. Like, I'm so proud of you for re recognizing that this is a really ra loud restaurant. What do you need? I need quiet. Okay. Well, how do you think you could go get that? Mom, do you think that I could go outside for a second and just sit on the bench and like take a moment before our food comes? That's a great idea. Sure. Because I want my children to be able to advocate for themselves and become independent in terms of regulating themselves. I don't want 
to be their regulator for the rest of their life. I don't want to be, you know, swaddling them at, at 12 years old. I, I don't want to be holding them at, you know, like I, I want them to be independent beings who can say, I think I need to go take a break in my room and do some drawing. I, I think I need to step away from this friendship and just let things cool down, right? Like I want them to be able to have their voice, not be afraid to use it. And so by really giving them these questions and autonomy to answer them and figure these things out for themselves is the crucial piece of both of those, releasing that codependency as well as giving them the independence of learning how to regulate for themselves and then them being able to ask themselves, okay, how do I feel right now? Okay, what do I need? You know, eventually. Yeah, it's profound because I think that, you know, as we're talking about this stage, what we're really trying to do is set them up for the next stage, which is around adolescence. And I, I've often thought of, uh, about it this way, that almost like zero to five, zero to six is really around doing all that I could to protect my kids, right? Wear your helmet, don't put your finger in the socket, just stepping to try to protect them. The next stage is really was really about preparing. How do I prepare my kids for what is happening in their, their life, right? And what they're about to experience. But then after that, they get in high, like late middle school and then high school. Adolescence is really the, the, the difficult stages that children go through, which is to be able to firmly identify and figure out who they are as individuals. But then how do they join the social world in ways that allow them to feel like they belong, that they are included? And sometimes those two things are really counter to one another. The things that they have to do in order to belong are, are contradictory to who they know themselves to be. I know my daughter has really struggled with this. She sacrificed some of her own personal values in order to belong in a social group that then turned on her. And now she not only didn't know who she was, she didn't know how to navigate this group and mean girl syndrome and all those things step in. So as we think about the adolescent stage of 13 to 18, what are the critical things that parents need to be doing to lean into this stage of development? You know, the example you just talked about, I think is one of the biggest reasons why we as parents struggle to hold boundaries with our kids. Because we sometimes think if we hold boundaries or we tell them right from wrong or like we give them natural consequences, we're shutting them down from owning their feelings or we're shutting them down from finding out who they are because all they're doing is just respecting, you know, the boundaries and the rules of, you know, be seen, not heard kind of thing. And that's a perfect example of like, we do want our children to be able to figure out and own their feelings and own who they are so that when they get in a situation like that, they can be like, does this fit me? Does this, does this suit me? Am I happy in this social setting? Or, or, or can I express my feelings? Do I feel safe in this social setting with these girls? Are, the, are these my people, you know? And I, I think that comes with trial and error, you know, I, I, especially for, I can only speak for me because I'm a female, but I think we all have those mean girl stages. Middle school to me is, is the hardest stage of there's always a ringleader somehow, you know, she's, the one and we all want to be besties with her and someday she wants to be besties with us because she might be a little narcissistic and she doesn't even know it yet and she may not be as an adult but like she's a little child who's a narcissist who's like oh you'll do for the day and like I'm annoyed with you for the day or like mm -hmm, we're going to talk behind that girl's back and you know we have to kind of learn through experience and that that aspect but giving a child a voice but also giving you a voice and owning that we both matter within a dynamic will help model later on that both children in a social dynamic matter and that, hey, my feelings matter too. And like at home, my feelings matter. So like, why wouldn't my feelings matter here too? And if they don't, or if you don't care, or if you're not nice, my hope is that we are giving these children these tools to be able to recognize that. But there still will be some ebb and flow and, and trial and error and, and bumps along the way. You know, that's, that's part of life and how we, we learn. Have you, have you ever read the book, uh, nature and the human soul Brooke? I haven't. Oh my God. Bill Plotkin's work. It's, I, I, I think you would get immense value out of it. It's an incredible 
It's an incredible book, uh, Bill Plotkin, Nature and the Human Soul. He basically, it's an approach to the developmental stages of, of life from, from birth to death. And through a, through a very uh, eco-centric framework. In other words, well, to shorten that, in adolescence, there's two tasks. There's two tasks in every stage that we go through, from infancy to adolescence to adulthood to elderhood. Every stage has two tasks. One is a culture task and one is a nature task. And I'm hearing like adolescence, the culture task is to f your, your, your focus is shifting away from the family and towards your peer group. And there's a culture task. Like, who am I? It's trying to figure out who am I in relationship to the culture? What is my role? Like, you know, who's my boyfriend? Who's not my boyfriend? Who are my friends? Who's my tribe? Who's not my tribe? Right? There's, a, there's that culture task. And that's, that's a challenging task. But there's also a nature task, which is who am I independent of all of that? And those are inherently can be at odds, Tate, to your point, you know, what your daughter's going through. You know, one of the things, Tate, you and I talk a lot about is paradox, right? As adults, particularly men, is because we work mostly with men, we, we talk about being able to hold paradox, right? Masterful living is being able to hold two apparently opposing ideas. Like I feel, I feel angry and I'm okay, for example, right? I feel pissed off. I feel, I feel, I feel horny. I want to have sex. And you know what? It's okay if we don't have sex. Like being able to hold these two opposites. And I, I just hear in that, it's like adolescence. Now we're really starting to step into also preparing children to be able to hold paradox. And you can't, like, how, how do you steward that? Like, Tate, you're in that right now. Like Stuart, you cannot save your daughter from the, these challenges or you just cannot in the same way. Like teenage boys, they start to write that. They would love for me to, and I would love to be <laughs> of able to. Of course. But that's the reality is that this, that, that's why in this world of where I, I, you talked about protect, you start in this protecting stage and you move to this preparing stage, the stage that I really feel like I'm in now with my daughter more than anything other is just being present. Right, to be being present for all that she's experiencing, knowing that I can't fully protect her anymore, knowing that I can't fully prepare her, even though to my heart's desire, I would love to continue to be able to do both. But if I overprotect or overprepare, it doesn't actually allow her to step into her greatness and all the things that she needs to go through. And what I now feel like I have to do is be present for her. And that is the hardest stage. It's been the hardest stage to really watch this struggle. And we actually empowered her recently to, to make her own decision about what school she would go to because the amount of mean girls that she was experiencing and really put it because what she had, it was that we were the ones that were holding her back. And then we said, you know what, guess what? We're not actually going to hold you back. You get a hundred percent of the, of the freedom to choose. And what that also means is now you have a hundred percent of the responsibility. So I want you to really get what's at stake here. There are some upsides to this and downsides to this. And whatever decision you make, there's going to be some grief and mourning inside of it. And so how can we be here for you and help you as you make this decision about whether or not to switch schools in the eighth grade and to tr go try to meet an entire new friend group to try to navigate, you know, and now it's like, I just got to be present for her. And that's a whole new skill as a, as a parent that I'm stepping into, my wife is stepping into because our, the, it's, it's a demand from her that we can't just protect her and prepare her anymore. Yeah. I think that we, again, it's that codependency of like, you have a cut, here's a Band-Aid. We're so wired for that with our kids. And then we need to very slowly say, the Band-Aids are over there. Don't forget to throw the trash away, you know? But yeah, it's still, yeah. when you get to this stage, it's still, it hits you like a ton of bricks of if we don't allow them to navigate these difficult challenges, experiences at this age, then we're just again fixing, right? And in order for them to learn from this or to look back on it and say, that was a really great choice. You know, I moved schools when I was in third grade and it wasn't my choice. And it was a huge part of my identity. Because I didn't want to move schools and I felt like I couldn't hack it at the other school. And there was a plethora of reasons why my parents decided to move me. And it was that the school that I went to, like, it was my favorite school experience out of all, like even college, like that school was my favorite school, hands down. 
but it's still, it, it like it was ingrained inside of me and a part of me that I, that I switched schools. And there's so much that impacts our life. And by giving her the autonomy to make the decision and then take the ownership of the decision she makes will allow the two of you to be more present because then she can't blame you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, and I, I, th- I know we're rounding the, the, our time together. Um, one of the things that, that I terrified me a year ago as I read a report from the CDC that, that talked about how one third of all teenage girls will experience suicidal ideation. And so it brings me to this, this, maybe the last stage that we'll talk about today is this young adolescence, right? 19 and above. And not that that doesn't happen, not that that doesn't happen before that, but, but I think what we now know to be true is that anxiety and depression are at an all time high. And that's, that's at all stages, right? There's more anxiety and depression in adults. There's more anxiety and depression in, in, in kids. There's more, uh, more of that in young adolescents. What can parents do for their kids who are experiencing anxiety and depression these days? You know, what's crazy is I thought you were going to say your biggest fear is that she gets pregnant. And like, I really honestly feel like if our parents were the ones sitting here having this podcast, that would be their fear. Like their fear would be, I hope to God my daughter does not get pregnant. And like, you know, my dad would be like, you know, the best birth control, take a pill and hold it between your legs and ha ha, like cool down, like whatever. But like, it goes to show how much we've evolved in, God, a short amount of time that we are that afraid of. I mean, that percentage is wild. It's scary. And, you know, I have, my children have a 50% higher chance, like a 50% higher chance that they will consider doing that in their life or think it's okay to do it. And I think that that is one of the reasons why these questions are so imperative, because it's not just if someone, you know, I I alluded to like, if you're locked in a classroom and someone's not doing something right and you need to express your feelings and say, like, own and feel in your gut and be okay, this is not okay. Like, this doesn't feel right. I need to open the door. I need to get out. I want my children to know that it is okay to share their feelings when it matters most. And for me, when it matters most is when it means life or death. I want them to be able to come to me and say, this is how I'm feeling. And these are not good thoughts. And these are really, really, really dark thoughts. Right. And I, I, I would rather hear all of that or, you know, maybe a child is, is wanting to come out and, and, and they're, you know, attracted to the same sex, or I feel really uncomfortable, you know, dating this person because this doesn't feel like my identity. But if we nurture those conversations with our children of allowing them to literally from the time they're on the playground of like, you know, well, how did it feel when Johnny didn't want to sit next to you today, you know, at lunch, rather than "Eh, we don't give a shit, like Johnny sucks, right? Like that's again, fixing it, putting a bandaid. But if we say, how did that make you feel? They might look at you and be like, huh? Like what? Like what? Like, I don't know how it made me feel. Cool. Let's talk about it, right? Here's these feelings and like, what's coming up for you? Because, you know, it's one thing to think it. It's another thing to write it. It's an entirely different ballgame to say it. Literally to say it out loud is the scariest thing you can do. But if you can practice that skill of saying it out loud and owning it and knowing that it's okay for the world or like literally even yourself to witness your own feelings or say them out loud and own that it's okay to have needs, that is, that's what it's about. It's, it's knowing that you're worthy enough to have those feelings. And it's, it's very, very scary. It's, it's extremely scary. But I think that if you you know, build a trusting relationship with your children and make sure that they have the tools they need to verbalize what's going on and know that they can talk to you about anything, then hopefully, even if they have those thoughts, they're going to come talk to you about those thoughts rather than just sitting with it on their own. And it's light, what you're saying is lighting me up because it, in a world of now trying to practice my presence more than anything else, that the, the one line that I'm saying more than any other to, to my kids these days is 
I'm so glad that you're talking to me about this. Yes. I'm just so glad that you're talking to me about this. And I have some room to, to grow and uh, well, tell me how you're feeling and where are you feeling that? What do you need? Like you've really, that, that's been a beautiful gift that you've given to me today. And I know that I'm at least doing that piece of it well, which is, I'm just so glad you're talking to me about this, Alexa. I'm so glad you're talking to me about this, Tate, because in a world of what I can do best for the rest of my life is I want to be present for them and I got to keep growing and developing and learning as a parent. But the gift of you and the world, which is planting these seeds for people to be picking up and then taking into their lives. Oh, I'm just so enlivened by it, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. Of thank course. You. Yeah. The biggest thing that I tell parents is after you ask your kids, how do, how do you feel? Literally, I tell them this over and over and over. And one client in particular thought it was so funny. And she like told all of her friends and they all made it a joke and all the different things. But every single time my child tells me, how do you feel? And every single time I'm working with any client, it's thank you for sharing. And anytime we practice that with our adult clients, we tell them, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Because that positive feedback loop in your brain needs to be completed in terms of like, I just got something positive out of sharing. Like I just got positive feedback saying that was a great job that I did. So maybe I'll do it again. Right. And so you're you saying, I'm really glad you're sharing this with me. I'm really glad you're talking to me about this. Like that is telling them it is more than okay. I want to know you matter and I will listen anytime. It's, it's just, you know, hearing you say that I'm, I'm aware that Tate, you know, in our, in our work with men, we, we, we create spaces where men get to share things that they really don't get to share anywhere else. And we'll often say, thank you for sharing. And I'm aware of two things. Number one, it's, it's, it can be a little uncomfortable to say that, to hear it, because again, that's, there's a story a lot of adult men carry, like I'm not supposed to share. I shouldn't share. I just looked weak. I looked, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And though I'm also aware that because we didn't hear that in our childhood, there is a healing that's happening, an old wound that's happening when we repeat those words, thank you for sharing. There's like a developmental stage thing that was missed in teenagehood that we're now doing the work of for some guys in their 40s and 50s. That is invaluable, invaluable. Brooke, you are such a, such a gift. Thank you. Brooke, I appreciate that. Brooke, we love you. I think, I think if you're willing, we're going to have you as a regular guest. I would love that. I I love our conversations. I think they're always great and really balanced. And um, yeah, I would love that. How can people, as we, as we conclude, we're wrapping up, uh, how can people well, uh, learn more about you? How can they work with you? Tell us more. Sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram. It's Brooke Weinst, which is half of my last name. You'll see my big curly hair pop up. All, all that'll be in the show notes as well under this episode. Thank you so much, Brooke. Again, we love you. We'll have you on again. Uh, just thank you. Thank you so much.